So, um, Harry, I'm going to give sort of three talks. Um, I'll try to last them together a little bit. I'll try to make them real short. So the ACL and, uh, tutorial was a three-hour talk. We're clearly not going to do that. There's a 10-minute uh, teaser, and I'm going to give a piece of that. But I suspect it will take more than 10 minutes. Um, but um, if, if, at some points when it gets too fast, you can just stop the video and slow down and enjoy it. Enjoy it. Um, um, So the tutorial, oh, first off, I want to talk about little languages. So GFT is a little language. Little languages come from Unix. And here's a, a description of John Bentley talking about uh, little languages in the 80s. Things like awk would be a little language. Um, we're going to propose another one, which I'll call GFT, or general fine tuning. It's based on this tutorial. There were six uh, uh, people at the tutorial. Um, and I uh, mostly, so the, the tutorial had part A and part B. Part A is the class is half full, and um, part B is the half empty. Um, so part A was to make deep nets accessible to the masses, including non-programmers. And part B is to advocate a combo of part A with um, traditional ideas in AI that go back decades, and things that work in linguistics and philosophy that go back centuries. Um, this link I'll show up many times, and there's lots of code, lots of videos, a whole lot more depth there. I can't possibly cover it all here. Um, now, I want to say that what's important about it is how little there is. There really are only four or five functions, and they mostly take four arguments. I'll show some examples of this, and there's hundreds of examples at the GitHub. Um, so this little language basically has just two functions you really need to know fit and predict. Fit is called fine-tuning in, in the machine learning literature, and predict is called inference in machine learning literature. But I prefer the fit and predict terminology that comes from, say, sklearn, which comes from sort of traditions of decades of work in statistics. Um, fit, basically, you start with a, a pre-trained model, you add some data, and then you get a post-trained model. And, um, and predict, is that I take a model, it could be pre-trained or post-trained, apply it to some input x, and I get some estimated labels out. And that's all there is. So um, that's pretty much all you need to know. And these programs are short, typically one line of code, um, hard to even call it programming. And I want to say there's no Python, and the examples on the hubs are just too complicated. You shouldn't need to know hundreds of lines of code to do what really should be basically regression. Um, and here's an example of a FIT program. Um, and, it, and I want it to look a lot like regression in standard statistics packages. You shouldn't really need to know how to code anything to use this. I want to make this accessible to a much larger audience. Now, um, so there's the pre-trained model as a BERT model. Um, the data would be a standard data set. Um, it's called emotion on hugging face. And then the output would be um, um, put in the outer directory. Um, for predict, I start with an input, say x is I love you. I throw it into this um, model, and it comes out with a positive um, estimated label, and it has a pretty high score. Now, um, I want to emphasize portability. So in Unix, all these little languages in Unix ran on every piece of hardware you can imagine anything from a Raspberry Pi to a supercomputer, um, pretty much the same thing. Um, here I, I want to support both, say, Hugging Face and a Chinese equivalent. Um, and uh, why would you want to do this? Well, they're somewhat different. So the Chinese equivalent has more support for Chinese than the American uh, one. But um, I think it's important to hedge across supply chains. Unix survived the test of time because it wasn't tied to any particular hardware. That's very important. Um, now, so here's what the equations look like. Um, it has a task, say classification, 
and then it has some references to some columns. Um, glue, you may have heard of glue. Glue is a standard benchmark. Everybody likes to talk about it. Um, this is basically the solution to all of the glue tests, well, at least eight of them, eight out of nine, and I'm showing it um, on one page, on one screen. That's pretty much all you need to do in order to do all of the glue tests. Uh, most of the glue tests are classification, but one of them is regression. Um, and if, if you want to extend this beyond glue, there's a couple more tests you might want to know about. Um, I, I won't get into these too much. So um, what do these tasks look like? Well, in classification, there are a couple ways to express that. Um, the Y is going to be one of, a, of a, a limited set of categorical variables. In regression, the Y could be a, a real value or it could be a real vector. Um, and then for the, we tend to think of question answering, or sometimes it's called squad, or those kinds of tasks. They, they, they act as if this is answering questions, but really all it's doing is classifying spans. So all you say is where a substring starts and where a substring ends. And the assumption is that there is a substring in the document that is the answer to the question. That's really much simpler than general question answering, but that's what passes for question answering in much of this literature. Anyway, that's a, another kind of classification or regression task. And then um, in named entity recognition, I again prefer to think of this as token classification. You have an output for every token, but it's still basically the same kind of thing. In speech recognition, you, you have the Ys are slightly different, but in all of these tasks, you can treat them as just trying to estimate some Y. Um, here's, uh, Hugging Face has a very nice uh, search engine so you can find lots of models and data sets and all sorts of things. Here I want to point out that a model is basically either a pre-trained or a post-trained test. And then um, you can see that if the model has the name base in it, then it's probably pre-trained. And if it has fine-tuned in it, then it's probably post-trained. But they're all pretty much the same. And um, it, there's lots of tasks here. They've got translation. They've got a field mask, a whole bunch of tasks. Um, I won't go into all that, but you don't all, this is pretty much, you don't need to know too much about this. That is, um, you can search around here. Now, in the longer version of the teaser, in the longer version of this, I go through more examples. I'll just talk about uh, three of the seven here. Um, so summary can tell you what's going on in a, in a model. It can tell you what's going on in the data set. It takes pretty much any argument uh, or any combination of them and would tell you what's going on. But if you use this contains um, argument, then it can find, do some searches. So the things in the box would find the most popular uh, data sets or models that contain the substring emotion. And so then from that, you can find um, the emotion uh, model that I'm going to use at the top. The E model is, is I'll just refer to as one of them. Um, and so this finds data sets on Hugging Face that have that, and this finds models that have that. Um, here we've got uh, a prediction. So I mentioned the I love you, and if it's by default, then it does sentiment analysis. But if you specify a model, then it does whatever the model does. And in this case, the model comes out with emotion class. Um, and here you can take the same input and throw it into a different task. And actually, that one, you're going to get the emotion classes. But the ones in below, I, it can say, I love New York. And with this thing, it would tell you that New York is a place. And if I say, I fill in the mask you, it will figure out that love is one of the things you might say there, although I think it's not the top choice. Um, and uh, people refer to token classification as named entity recognition. But um, I think named entity recognition really should go beyond just um, classifying each of the tokens, but that's what this does. And then um, fill mask is, is an old task inside the, inside the psycholinguistics um, that's well studied. Um, so in the longer version of the teaser, I get into a whole lot more. I'm going to skip all that here. Um, there are hundreds of examples. Um, pretty much, though, they all illustrate the same thing that I've already mentioned here. Um, now, um, let me just end this sort of discussion of this little language 
by saying, if you have the code in yellow, where I've got a, a little bit of a program, and I say for model in some set of models, give the same input um, to the same function, you get different results on what, um, the, uh, the, what model you use, and I'll show sentiment analysis, fake news, and spam hand detection. So here is a bunch of models where I gave it the input, I love you, and they mostly came back with positive, although this first model was not very confident. On a two-way force choice, you'd think you could be a little bit more confident than 51%. Um, any rate. Um, now, if you come back, the bad news is that almost all these models think it's fake news. And there is a split decision about whether it's spam. Um, now, one could complain that I shouldn't take a model that was trained on Spanish and give it English and expect anything reasonable. And it's probably even worse to give it to a model that was trained on Chinese. But anyway, people do this kind of thing. And, um, so this makes it very easy to do the wrong thing. Um, so um, now, what about part B? So part A is the glass is half full. Um, it makes it super easy to do much of what's in the literature. You really don't need the program in order to do that. Uh, it's amazing how much can be done with so little. And I think this also demystifies this. Nobody would say that regression and classification is AI. I don't want to say this is AI. But this is what we do that we're now all excited and things. This is what's giving all the excitement about AI. Now, um, the three authors here are myself and two of my colleagues from China. Um, they're on the part A, the half full. Now, we have some people who are more on part B, which is there's a lot of stuff this doesn't do. And so Gary gave the talk last, last time, and he's deeply skeptical. And Ernie, his co-author, is also pretty skeptical. Ernie did most of the part B for the tutorial. And um, they're mostly pushing what I would call traditional views in AI. There's a whole lot of things we'll get to that um, this part A doesn't deal with. And in fact, I think the literature in DeepNets doesn't deal with. And they argue we should deal with it. Um, and then there's also even, you know, that's decades of work in AI. And then there's centuries of work in linguistics and philosophy, um, which is also not addressed. Um, so what are some of the things that are here? So a lot of the history behind the sort of modern language model work, it goes back to the, to the 50s. Uh, there were British lexicographers like Firth. It has this famous quote, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. The work that I did with Patrick Hanks on point-wise mutual information is very much um, uh, guided by this tradition. And word to Beck and Bert are pretty much more of the same. All these things are looking for collocations, words that appear near each other more than chance. The strength of these things is they're amazing on fluency. And um, they're also pretty good at what psycholinguists refer to as word associations. They've got lots of weaknesses. They really can't tell truth from misinformation. They make stuff up. Um, and there's really nothing about logical form, truth, time and space, possible worlds, no, no understanding of meaning, and no real understanding of purpose, like what we might call discourse structure or document structure. No common sense knowledge. So let's talk about negation. That's sort of one of the easiest things. There's this nice example. Um, a robin is a blank, fill in the blank. Bert figures out that it's bird. Then give it, a robin is not a. There are not very many things that are wrong, but Bert finds out that this is also bird. It's about the only thing it could get wrong, but it did. Um, now, what's going on? Well, collocations have a problem to uh, separating synonyms and antonyms. By construction, they look for things that appear near each other. Corpora are full of, of texts that compare things and contrast things. And they have no idea that what's, what's a comparison, what's a contrast. So it's really, really close to be that far apart. Okay, um, And uh, this is a problem. Collocation does not mean synonym. It means collocation. Um, now, um, these things have a tendency. It's called hallucination is a technical term. Um, these things um, you know, hallucinate. That is, they, they basically make up alternative facts faster than you can fact check them. And this is kind of a more serious or more dangerous problem. People are likely to believe some of the stuff they make up. Um, so here's an example. The bold thing is the prompt. That's what I gave it. 
And for a little while, it's kind of reasonable. But on the next page, it's just kind of stunning. So I grew up in Rhode Island. My father went to Brown. I was taught at Brown for 63 years. Um, so I kind of, my eyes perked up when I saw all this discussion of Rhode Island. The next thing I noticed is the very same thing happened in two adjacent years. It was the first time it happened in two adjacent years. So it couldn't possibly be true. But it's worse. None of the dates are right. None of these facts are true. Don't believe any of this stuff. All right? Um, you know, it's all made up. It kind of looks good enough, and it's so fluent that you might believe it, but don't. So fluency is different from accuracy. Now, what about, so Grace had all this stuff about, you know, that you're, you, there's purpose to what you're doing. You're trying to communicate. You're trying to, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to, to confuse the audience or something. I'm trying to make my point, and there, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's been written about this. There's a whole lot of things about, you know, a narrative, how you organize, a, you know, you say everything three times or whatever. Um, um, that GPT-3 doesn't know any of that. It's very, very good at collocations, things that appear near each other in a short context. But it's sort of wandering around in circles. There's no, there's no point. There's no beginning, no end. It's all just going around in circles. Um, Ernie came up with these ways to test its space. And I think it basically on these questions is pretty close to chance. Um, this isn't GPT-3, but other systems would have a problem like this. They might want to represent countries by point, you know, the center of points. And so Russia is really far from Ukraine. Um, and um, uh, there's all kinds of stuff has been written in linguistics over the centuries about time and space. Um, there are often times to try to connect uh, syntax to semantics in interesting ways. I might say the subjunctive would somehow connect to possible worlds. And um, you know you could make a, a rich kind of story about that. People have said all kinds of things about the semantics of time. I won't get into that, but I want to say there are decades of work in AI and centuries of work in language and philosophy, and machine learning does not make all that obsolete. What it really learns is collocation. And collocation is, is good. It helps you with fluency. That's really nice, but it's only part of the problem. Um, short-term fixes, Ernie suggests a whole bunch of short-term fixes. But I think Ernie would say, and Gary would certainly say, read their book, um, right? That, and, and I'll end with that. So go read their book. Um, let me now move on. So one of the questions I got at the end of part A when I gave the tutorial was, um, you know, what about bias? And what about bias? OK, so but Ernie certainly talked about bias. These things are biased. Of course they're biased. Um, but one of my concerns was, so my first answer was, that's not part A, that's part B. Wait for Ernie to say. Ernie will tell you about that. That's a nice non-answer. Now, let me give the real answer that I'm afraid of, which is bias is bad, but there's worse stuff in the world. So I'm worried about risk 2.0. Risk 1.0 are bad. Risk 2.0 are worse. Um, now, um, let me go back and talk about sort of when I first got into lexicography, it was through people like um, Patrick Hanks. And they introduced me to actually friends of my father's. It was, this is a small world. The Brown Corpus was collected at Brown. I was growing up at, near Brown. Um, so you know, I got exposed to this. But anyway, I didn't really realize how the world was from my own upbringing until I got introduced as you know, much later. Um, and the old days before the corpus work, dictionaries were prescriptive. They would teach you how the language ought to be spoken, how to speak like the king's English. I can't get a job teaching English in Europe because I speak the wrong language. All right, um, uh, and uh, you know, I think what they tried to change the world with the corpus sort of stuff was that we want to teach how the language is spoken, not how it should be spoken. All right now, one of my concerns with the current movement to try to debias a corpus is that it feels like a return to prescriptive things. I don't want to teach you how you should think. You know? Now, I don't want to say we should have all terrible thoughts, but you know, if everyone uses four-letter words, then you know, we ought to know that. And you know, just can't cancel it totally. Now, I don't want to go where social media is, and this is where I'm kind of concerned, that social media has become, it's actually overemphasizing the bad stuff. And we'll get to that. Um, but I'd like to represent 
you know, the good and the bad and the ugly, such as it is, but not, but, but how one forms it. Now, here's, there's this discussion from Zuckerberg, where at least he starts with this and then tries to riff on that. But his view is that if you censor at some point, actually the stuff that comes up to the line but doesn't cross the line gets sort of maximum engagement. And I encourage you to go Google the Smothers Brothers Get Canceled. Um, it was this show across the line in my day. Um, and if I, I bet if you look at the show now, you can find it on YouTube, why they got canceled. And I think you would find that in today's context, it's both not funny and not edgy. You don't see what's wrong with it. Um, but um, they crossed the line that doesn't exist anymore. Um, now, another show that didn't cross the line was Laughter. And one of the things, they, would, they were always going right up to the line, and they were really sticking it more to the censor than to the people. And they would say, look that up in your funk and wagnalls, because the censor was looking for seven words you can't say, and only those seven words. And funk sounds like one of them. And whenever they said something that was kind of close to the line, they would say, go look that up in your funk and wagnalls. Now, the irony of this, and I don't think they knew it, is that um, one of my colleagues, Chap, had, was the author of all three of these books, but he was blacklisted, so his name's only on two of them. His name's not on the Funk and Wagons Dictionary. Um, all right. Now, why he was blacklisted, well, that's a long story, but it wasn't for anything he did. I think it's for something, someone he knew did something, but maybe they didn't do much. It really is a stupid story. Anyway, he is an expert on slang, and this dictionary of slang is all the stuff you shouldn't say, and he's an expert on that. And people are really interested in what you can't say, especially people that don't know English. Um, so this book is a big seller in Europe. And um, what he did for his field work, so his politics are a little left of center in this country. Um, and um, he would listen to right-wing talk radio, which is kind of the precursor to the really toxic stuff now. And he referred to this as guilty pleasure because he realized it was shocking and engaging, even though he didn't agree with it. And, and their language, he was really interested in their language because it's not like the language of his friends and family. And he was trying to understand that language. So anyway, he has excellent coverage of all the stuff you shouldn't say. And I think we shouldn't delete it, we should, we, but we should understand it and we shouldn't say it. Okay? Um, now I'm going to say biases are everywhere. So here's an LREC paper I gave kind of recently. And, um, and the LREC paper, um, I started with Bert and I fine-tuned Bert using the stuff in the in the Art Ed, and um, I fine-tuned it on a, on a thesaurus that was 100 years old. So it's probably I used that 100-year-old thesaurus thesaurus because it was out of copyright. And so you train it, you fine-tune it on all these synonyms and antonyms. I mentioned that Bert has a problem separating synonyms and antonyms, but you can train it to deal with this problem, and it does pretty well on that. And another kind of interesting thing is that although I trained it on the on words, you can now test it on text. And so I could test it on multi-word expressions or even sentences or paragraphs or whatever you like. And it kind of learns that freedom fighter is good and white supremacist is bad. Hey, that's pretty nice. But it also learns things that really sh you shouldn't say, like white is good and black is evil. Um, and you know, I don't know where this is coming from. Is it coming from my program? Is it coming from the 100-year-old Thesaurus? Or is it coming from whatever Bert was trained on? This is probably these biases are everywhere you look. And we probably don't want to put on blinders and, and hide ourselves from reality. But we do have to improve. We don't want to, you know, right. right. Now, um, so Kathy O'Neill wrote this book about five years ago, and I want to talk about the things that she talked about. I'm going to refer to them as risks 1.1, 1.0, and say, those are risks. And I want to, she was mostly concerned about what were the implications of those risks on the people who are being treated unfairly. I want to take the view of, suppose you're an engineer and you work for one of these tech companies, and you put out a product that does something stupid. Um, and gets canceled on day one, that's not good for you. So it's, you know, it's not just, it's not only is it not good to, to do something stupid, but it, 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 you know, it's not good for anybody. Now, by stupidity, I want to say to errors humans who really screw things up, you need a computer. 
and computers are quite capable of doing it. So this is some examples I'll give. There was a spelling correction. Before I worked on spelling correction at Microsoft, they were really worried about some mistakes I think they made in a previous version. I'm not certain they did it, but I think they did. Anyway, there was a time when Obama was a rising star and Ben Laden was a kind of known quantity. And they um, did a spell correction from Obama to Osama. And you don't get to make, you get a very good precision recall, but if you make one mistake like that, you're out of business. Um, and um, there was, we had a bot, um, again, this is probably, I'm not sure if this is true, but I think it was. So the, the kids could chat with Santa. And if the kids mentioned snow, you would say, I like drugs too. Um, so that bot didn't last long. Um, okay. Then 20 years or so before Kathy wrote her book, Microsoft got sued for something stupid. And um, more recently, you probably all know about this bot that they did more recently that, that did something stupid and got canceled on day one. Now, what I kind of think is that people who live in glass houses shouldn't throw stones. So. Um, the guys who are having a good fun at Mark Microsoft's expense, I mean, I really feel sorry for the guys who worked really hard on this bot. They probably worked a couple of years, and then on day one, they're out of business, all right? And now they get to be written up in all the press. But one of the things that's kind of interesting here is that this press is using all this salty language. And then look, they put this ad for Disney right next to the salty language, all right? So, you know, they're, they're no better, okay? Um, uh, you, this is not good for business. Okay, now, um, now what I'm worried about though is, okay, so I'm gonna say, risks 1.0 are serious. You can get your product and get canceled. You could make lots of people angry with you. This is not good for business. But I'm gonna say risk 2.0 are much worse. Okay, so when you're talking about, you know, January 6th or insurrection, you know, killing people is worse than treating you badly. Um, right. um, and um, this new book about the chaos machine takes uh, risk 1.0 and starts saying, you know, maybe we got bigger problems. And they're suggesting the bigger problems is that somehow we put together machine learning and social media in a way that became addictive. And maximizing engagement can be dangerous. It has risks for public health and public safety. And um, it's also insanely profitable. So just as you wouldn't expect the tobacco companies to try to sell fewer cigarettes, you probably can't expect the companies that are making lots of money to stop making lots of money. Um, but even the countries are kind of you know, um, complicit in this because the top companies by the market cap are driving our economy. And if we really you know, put the kibosh to this, the recession could be really serious. Now, one of the things I'm worried about though is what's our role in all of this? So are we actually, we're doing all this work on risk 1.0, and is that really helping us towards risk 2.0, or is it even part of the problem? So this book that's talking about risk 2.0 doesn't even mention, mentions lots of things, but it doesn't mention any of the things that we're doing about risk 1.0, and that scares me. Um, and then another thing that sort of emphasized this is that um, uh, Facebook got in trouble with my um, MIT alumni magazine, um, a reporter from that magazine wanted to talk to Facebook about 2.0 risks, and they kept wanting to talk about all the work they're doing working on 1.0 risks. And they accused Facebook of pivoting from the 2.0 to the 1.0. And we could say, well, look, Facebook, they're just evil and they deserve it. But I don't know if that's true or not, but what I want to say is that this, what goes around comes around if we have to come up with an answer to this question. What are we going to do about 2.0 risks? Right? And we could be accused if we work on 1.0 of not addressing this and even distracting from the real problems. Um, so you can see more of that. Now let me move on to um, what uh, Osama refers to as IR 3.0. Now this is work in progress. I, don't, I didn't have answers to the last question. I don't have answers to this one either, but let me raise some more questions, right? So um, I'd like to build a recommender system, and I want to say most recommender systems will really think about relevance, but I think we also want something about importance or credibility. I wouldn't want to recommend a document that is really on topic. The only problem is that it's misinformation, all right? Um, 
You know, that's not a good recommendation. So don't recommend return papers that are buzzword compliant, but not credible. All right. um, now, I actually am kind of concerned about things like recommender systems used in conferences. So when I first started EMLP, we assigned papers to reviewers by hand. And these days, it's all done by machine. And you know, to err is, is, is human. To really screw things up, you need a machine. And the machine is really screwing things up. Um, now, um, my conjecture is the machine's really screwing things up. Um, and do we know if the software is safe and effective? Have we put it through the kind of testing we would use for um, medicine, for a drug? And I don't think so. I don't think the evaluations have ever been done. Just everyone uses the software and says, well, the problem is so big, how can we do it any other way? And I just don't buy that. Um, I want to say the autobatic assignments are worse than what we used to do. Um, and the reviewers are less qualified and less sympathetic to the background and the target audience. And that's ridiculous. Um, and I think if we had better assignments, we'd have better conferences. And it should be, people say, with the scale, makes it impossible to do. No, no. The dating problem should be easier at scale. That is, if the, if the community is larger, it should be easier to find good matches. Doesn't get, you know, that, that's crazy. Um, I, I wrote an opinion piece on this, and I'm saying that People are soda chasing. They're doing this mindless metrics because um, if, if we've taught the, the authors to write papers that bad reviewers can review, you don't need to know anything to know that this number is the top of the leaderboard, so it should be accepted. That's a crazy argument, all right? But that's what all our papers, our conferences are full of because the reviewers can't handle any argument that's deeper than that. Um, now, I like to talk about text and context. So the text is properties of a document, and the context is properties of all the other documents. And um, I want to say there should be better together. So examples of text would be, say, titles and abstracts, maybe even the full text. You could represent this as a bag of words, where Spectre now uses um, a BERT-like embedding to uh, capture the first 512 subword units of a document. Right? They, they talk about some citations, but I, I think that mostly they're talking about the first 512 subword units. That's not very representative of a full document, especially when your whole thesis is a lot more than the title and half the abstract, um, or the first half of the abstract. Um, and uh, the context, so in web search, there's something called anchor text, which is um, all the words of, in all the links that are pointing to this page. And they're somehow more credible than anything that's on your page. Um, so the analog of that would be citing context, the sentences in other documents that refer to uh, my document. That, that's maybe more representative of my document than anything that's in my document. Um, and the citations, um, I'm going to propose an embedding based on citations. Um, now, we, for those of you at Northeastern, we have this discovery cluster. And I encourage you to come with uh, talk to me about this. And we have a lot of stuff on the cluster now, and I'm happy to share. And I love to build a community on all this. Um, there are recommender systems out there. PubMed has one that is really, I think, quite good. Um, and um, uh, lots of people use it. And it's, they refer to it as similar arguments, similar articles. And uh, Semantic Scholar has another one. Now, um, Semantic Scholar is sort of a West Coast thing. It's Allen AI. And uh, the new thing in Silicon Valley and the whole West Coast is to move fast and break things. Um, um, the government and National Library of Medicine, and especially when you get close to medical stuff, they don't tend to move fast and they don't break things. Um, um, and sometimes, maybe, it's better to be a little careful. Um, anyway, I, I, have, I don't know how to do a careful analysis of the two, but I think they're interestingly different. Um, I think that the Semantic Scholar is based on new BERT-like deep net stuff. And I think the old one is based on work that Jimmy Lin did um, actually before when he was an intern um, a couple of decades ago. And so it uses old methods. But I think that National Library of Medicine has um, vetted it a lot more before they deploy. Um, and so it's not as fancy technology, but actually might well be more credible. 
um, what Henry, uh, uh, we need to do an evaluation. Um, I want to talk about embedding. So in this case, we have, say, 200 million papers. I'll refer to those as nodes or n in a graph. And then we have, um, in, if you do specter, where the last layer of the BERT model is going to be the, the vector. And so it's got 768 hidden dimensions. So I get an n by k matrix. And the similarity of two papers would be the cosines of those two vectors. Um, you could do rank retrieval by just putting this into an approximate nearest neighbor. So the query would be one of these rows. And then the, um, um, the answer would be a, a ranking of the n best um, uh, similar things and cosines similarity. And there are lots of ways to do that. So the spectra embeddings, there's actually a lot of them. You can, they offer, they're really nice about offering you all kinds of access to this. So you can do a bulk download and download the whole n by k matrix. Um, you can also do online, so you can, they've got an API, so you could say, here is a document, what's the vector? And they also provide you a hugging based model, so you could um, do that as well. Um, now I'm going to propose an alternative, which I'll call um, based on node to vec. So you start with a graph, um, and from the graph I can get an embedding. So the graph has the 200 million nodes, and it has about 2 billion edges. These edges would be citations. All right? um, and they, um, hugging, I mean, Allen AI provides all of this. Um, and you can represent this thing as a sparse um, Python um, SciPy matrix. And now I want to say, I want to turn, I want to create this embedding M, which would be an N by K matrix. And you do this by basically SVD. So I could say that if I took that graph and I do the SVD factoring on that graph, then I get a, uh, I just say M is going to be the U matrix and we're kind of done. Now, um, and then the cosine similarity of all pairs of papers would just be um, M times M transpose. Right, and we're kind of done. Um, and the prone method is um, pretty much that. Um, it's a little fancier than that, but it's a it's based on it's an improvement on node to vec, but it's in that direction. Now the interpretation of this is that the embedding could be viewed as spectral clustering, and I want to say that M and G are just two views. It's sort of like in speech, I can have the the time domain and the Fourier domain of the same speech waveform. And I wouldn't want to say that one of these has more degrees of freedom than the other. They're just two representations of the same thing. The Fourier domain might be more convenient for doing some filtering operation. The time domain might be more convenient for other operations. Um, they're just two views of the same thing. One of them doesn't have more degrees of freedom than the other. The number of degrees of freedom would be the number of parameters in the optimal representation of whatever I'm looking at. And if one of these has more parameters than the other, it just means that I've got redundant parameters. It doesn't mean that there are more degrees of freedom. Um, and so cosines on M are like commute distances on G. So commute distance on G is like a random walk from paper I to paper J and back to I. And I need the round trip to make it symmetric. Cosine is symmetric. The, ran, the, ran, the commute distance is symmetric. Um, as I said, um, uh, Allen AI makes their stuff super available. So you can get all the vectors for all these papers. You can also get the model yourself. And then you can get a vector for your own text. Um, now, a lot of people think this embedding stuff is kind of new. But in fact, embedding stuff was done 30 years ago. And in some ways, the work they did 30 years ago might still be very competitive. Because they were doing it, what they did was actually looking at the full text. Whereas what we're doing these days is just looking at the first 512 subword units. And the first 512 subword units doesn't give you the same information as the full text, or a bag of words, or something. Um, now, the conjecture here, and this I can't at all prove, but I kind of suspect that there should be a deep connection between deep nets and SVD. Um, and so um, both the spectra embedding and the node to vec embedding are pretty much the same kind of thing. They're both giving me two views 
of the same object. Now, they are different because the text is not the same as the context, but they're kind of sim they're more similar than not. Um, and there's this kind of question we have with scale. So people, you know, we used to be kind of worried about like deep nets are different than old fashioned regression. Old fashioned regression, I used to get nervous if I had too many parameters. If I had more parameters than observations, that was a big no no. Right? And I still grow up feeling uncomfortable about this. Nowadays with deep nets, they say no, it actually gets better. The more parameters you have, the better it is. All right, there's no problem here. What's the big deal? Just try it, be happy. Okay, okay. Now, I still feel a little uncomfortable about it, but here's how I'm coming to terms with this. I wanna say that the embedding is just an SVD factorization of something else. And the something else has many fewer parameters than you think it has. And when I factor it, so if I took that sparse matrix G and I factored it, and I didn't do any dimension reduction. I'd have n squared parameters. And n squared is way bigger than the number of edges. All right? I only have two billion edges. I don't have n squared parameter edges. All right? But I don't want to say they're not doing the overfitting, that in fact the SVD gets better if I do less dimension reduction. So it's not that the number of parameters in the SVD is not the number of degrees per year. All right? And so we're just counting the degrees of freedom wrong when you do that. The model isn't as big as you think it is. And so I now wrote an opinion piece where I came to terms and I kind of now believe bigger is better in all kinds of ways, but bigger isn't what you think it means. Anyway, just go read that, another teaser. So metrics of success, when you start out, you think you're doing good and you publish a lot of papers. After a while, I say, no, 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 that's not the metric. The new metric is citations. And when I write opinion pieces, the metric I care about are views. Okay. They're all different metrics, and whatever you measure, you get. Right? Now, I want to say they're different. So one of the things is that most papers in this collection are never cited. 57% of the papers I have, no citations. Right? That's sad, but true. Right? So if there was a paper out there in the forest, and nobody cited it, did it exist? Right? <laughs> okay. At any rate, um, you know, how many papers are there with 10 citations? 17%. How many with 100 or more citations? Less than 2%. How many with 1,000? Not many. Okay. 90,000 out of two, two, 200 million is a kind of drop in the bucket. Right. Um, at any rate, so it's, a, it's one of these zip wall on tail things. It's a few papers that are cited a lot. A lot of, a lot of papers that kind of don't count. And we shouldn't be, re we shouldn't be recommending papers that didn't happen, didn't count, didn't make a sound, and, um, and that would help us. We want to direct the attention towards the good stuff. Time invariance. So we tend to think that once I publish the paper, it's done. Okay, all right? And I kind of think that sort of the standard, like LSA embedding, or the standard spectrum embedding, is kind of time invariant. You publish the paper, the vector never changes. I want to say with the proposed method, it also takes into account the context. What does the audience think of it? And that's a moving target. Um, and let me give a sense of this. So I wrote a couple of these opinion pieces, and I want to draw your attention to these big blue arrows. Right? So in, in one case, the, uh, um, the, 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 the views went, you know, they, they took a big hockey stick. They went up after a while. I think this is not for anything I did. I think the journal started promoting papers that had a lot of views. And so once I cross the threshold, the rich get richer. All right, and thank you very much. Um, now, the next paper was that I wrote a paper um, a year before Putin invaded Ukraine that used the word Cold War. And then a year later, something happened. And um, I don't want to thank Putin for that one, but um, anyway, that happened. Um, so the, the audience reaction is very much part of the paper, <laughs> okay? And the paper, and the audience might react for reasons that are nothing to do with them, and you know, uh, stuff happens. Um, so a recommender system should find stuff that is relevant and credible, and priors really matter a lot. This is the priors are sort of like credibility or page rank or something like that. Um, here I just use citations for that. So the top set are the papers 
up here, I don't, oh, you can't see my screen. Right. The top set are the papers that are set, are, are coming from Spectre. The bottom ones are papers that come from um, uh, the proposed node to DEC thing. They both use the query, which is the upper left-hand corner. And um, they return pretty much a completely different set of, of documents. The only thing that's in common is the top one. The rest of them are all different, right? These, the, these methods are kind of, just get you completely different answers. The top set, you're mostly getting stuff that has very small number of citations um, and gets really low ranks by the other method. The bottom set has very low ranks by the first, by the other method. And, um, but it's got somewhat more citations. And so I think that spectral clustering is doing something interestingly different. But if you wanted to maximize citations, there would be something else you wouldn't use. Now, why is an important paper important? So this thing could return important papers, but people might want to say, why did you return that? And now, I want to say that for the explanation task, I don't think I would do it by looking at the paper. I want to say what's actually more important are the citing context. So consider Turing's paper, where in the 30s, he, he wrote this paper that now has a massive number of citations. And I want to say it's important because he introduced what's now known as a Turing machine and what's now known as the halting problem. Right? But he didn't mention either of those words in the paper. Um, that's what we all mentioned, what we know it for. So if you go look at the context that people cited in, they all mention those terms, right? But those terms came in after we wrote that paper. Similarly, in my paper with Patrick Hanks on what introduced was now known as pointwise mutual information, we didn't use those terms. Those terms are in the citing context of our paper. They're not in our paper. So I say, if you want to know the reason why the community thinks this is interesting, don't look at the paper, look at the citing context. So the current status, this is work in progress. I don't have any evaluation yet. I'm open to collaboration. I love to collaborate on this stuff. Um, where we proposed an alternative embedding that's based on citations on context and not on text. And this is really a proof of concept. I don't want to say the text is better than context or vice versa. I think there's a better together story. But I wanted to sort of contrast what most people are doing with something else. Um, and, um, um, I want to say that the context changes over time. The text is time invariant. Once it's published, it doesn't change unless there's a correction or retraction. Um, and uh, so that's pretty much what I had to say. Thank you. So is it, can I handle queries where there's a disjoint? Or is this about, where do the, la the labels? I don't know where I've got labels. Oh, so is this a question about the first part, GFT? Yes. Yeah. 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 So um, yeah, I think that uh, the classification model doesn't assume that the classes are um, uh, mutually exclusive or exhaustive. I don't think that's hardwired in. Um, I, I think the class, I didn't say they were, I don't think. Um, yeah. Um, I, I, I hope that's helpful. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's been a little while since I thought about it. But I, I think my solution is really based very much on hugging face code for doing classification. And I thought that hugging face doesn't really require the classes to be mutually exclusive. So, um, if a comment, there's anyone in the room that wants to ask a question before I continue in the chat? Yeah. 
Does somebody want to be one of our audience? Anybody here have a question? Yep, yeah, right here. I, I have one. <laughs> um, do, you, do you have any uh, thoughts about, um, so you're talking about the co-location having a particular relationship. I wonder if you have any thoughts or if you've done any like, analysis of like citation, because I can imagine like- Co-citation. Huh? You mean co-citation? Yeah, co-citation, I guess, would be the, the word for it. So like yeah. citating, uh, citing a, a paper that has been cited a lot, like the original Burke paper, right? May not, it may not be as relevant to the Oh, um, so that's a different issue. So, you know, but in, in, in IR, they usually do something like IDF weighting. And the idea is that a stop word, the, is not a very good keyword. Um, if I tell you this paper cited the Burt paper, I haven't told you much. Actually, worse would be if I told you this, this, uh, this paper cited a popular textbook. That I haven't even told you less because many things that cite the textbook would cite different chapters of the textbook. And so if I cited chapter one in the textbook and you cited chapter two, there's probably not very much in common, except we might be in the same field, right? But maybe not even that, okay? Um, um, so yes, yeah, so I think the spectral clustering kind of understands that. Um, but you know, I, um, I, I think that remains to be shown, but I think that IDF weighting is a kind of special case of spectral um, Does anybody else in the room have a question? Yeah, Joe? I built a model a little while back where the was a critical stop word. I'll tell you more about it later. Uh, <laughs> well, oh, I should say there's a difference. I've been fascinated with the compare and contrast author identification with, inf with information retrieval. The mathematics is about the same, except in author identification, I ignore the, the content words and only use the function words. And in information retrieval, it's the reverse. I wanted to ask. Yes, please. Great presentation, almost three in one. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to try to connect the dot and ask: Do you see any of risk 2.0, as you call it, playing out in IR 3.0? Um, do yes. these recommendation so, systems run the risk? Of I think the literature is kind of like social media. Can, can you please re repeat the question for the oh, people online? That would be great. No, thank so you. So the question was, um, is the, the, I talked in the middle part, I talked about risk 1.0 and risk 2.0. And in the, in the last part, I was talking about citation graphs. And I want to say that I think of the citation graphs as like social media, right? There's a lot of back and forth, you know, so the, you know, they introduce BERT, and then I do a refine, then I do cyber, and then somebody like matches up that, and they match up the other one. And sometimes it's kind of constructive like that, but sometimes it's just downright nasty. You know, there's my school and your school, and everything we do is good, and everything you do is bad, and vice versa, right? You know, okay. And it's not always it's not always good. And now I want to say this this dynamics of you know the toxicity can work in the academic literature, just as it works in, in there. Now, I think one of the things that makes the toxicity so nasty is the market maker, somebody like the social media company, is now actually figured out they can make money trafficking in misinformation. And so they actually make money by fanning the flames. Think about this like on a schoolyard where the kids are duking it out, and then everyone goes around the two kids who are fighting, and there's a huge group saying, yelling, Fight, 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 okay? Now maybe we're like that in academia, but I think we, we try to be a little more, you know, respectful, at least sort of on the veneer, right? Um, Ken, at two o'clock if you want to sign off. You're the moderator. All right. We do have a number of questions I know. in the chat. Would, would you would... tell everybody that we'll, e we'll email them the answers to the questions? <laughs> Okay. Um, now I don't. I lose this chat when I log off. Are you already captured? I'll take everything down. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So I'll try to deal with the questions um, offline. I guess I'm sorry for the late start. Um, all right. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, we're going to sign off from here. But please check the website for our next seminar, which is next week at the same time. Thank you so much. Thank you.